Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price but stay for the service. And we are back. And if you're joining us now, we are just getting our first conversation for this morning started. And as we said before the break, we are joined by representatives from the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry talking about some of their initiatives uh, that they are embarking on uh, to uh, deal with a lot of different issues related to COVID-19. Uh, so this morning we are joined by Marissa Longsworth, who is the president of the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, we have uh, Jordi Williams, who is a counselor and we are also joined via Zoom by uh, Catherine Main, who is the Vice President of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, morning. guys. Good morning. Right. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you. We definitely appreciate uh, the, your time and coming in uh, to talk to us. Now, uh, before uh, the break, Marlene and I were talking a little bit about COVID fatigue. And of course, I'm sure that's being felt by the business community as well. So before we get into the topics, can you just uh, give a little bit of um, uh, uh, an update from the chamber on, on how the business community is coping, especially with the rising cases and the new regulations that were just passed yesterday? Right. Well, thank you and good morning, everyone. Good morning, Belize. Um, thank you for tuning in this morning. Um, I think there, there are two, two categories of what's happening in the business community with some fatigue and some total breakdown. Mm -hmm. We know that there are several businesses that have not survived, that are closed indefinitely, and um, have thought that it is essentially cheaper for them to wait this out if they can. Um, because when you look at the matters of dealing with employees, when you look at the matters of keeping your overheads, um, you know, up to date and so on, all your bills, we're seeing that businesses are having big difficulties uh, keeping that maintained. Even in terms of our membership, mm -hmm. one of the indicators for us has been that there has been a slight drop in membership during this period. Mm -hmm. And of course, we understand that that is a part of the decision making that members do have to make to say, look, I am down to my last dollar what can I spend on? What is up seemingly optional to me or not? Mm -hmm. um, and so that has been an indicator that for us has directly touched our bottom line as a chamber. Remember that we are also a business too. We have Western Union as one of our businesses. And so we have had this experience of COVID fatigue. But one thing that I think that the chamber wants to mention is that a part of mitigating the fatigue a part of dealing with the issues of fatigue is giving businesses predictability if we understand what happens when there is an increase in conditions or increase in circumstances that requires certain adjustments to be made and we understand way in advance what type of adjustments those would tend to be at different phases then I believe, and I think the Chamber also believes, since we have been lobbying, this, lobbying for this since 2020, that you build confidence. Marlene, you must remember I was here last year mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about business confidence building measures mm -hmm. in that if you give businesses predictability, and I remember us talking about even how we deal with hurricanes, we have flags, mm -hmm. and you know that if it's a red flag, it's a phase one, mm -hmm. and this is the type of preparation you do for phase one. If or category two hurricane, you intensify category three, category four. We have been lobbying for that kind of approach for quite a while now, because we feel as though if businesses are able to know, hey, based on the numbers, by the next two weeks, we might be going into the orange phase. Mm. What do we do at the orange phase? What that means is that this haphazard knee-jerk reaction to SIs that come out mm. would not occur in the way that they're currently occurring because the SI would fit in with the structures and protocols that are in place to say, okay, we're moving into the red phase now. Mm -hmm. Businesses understand what that means and they, they immediately take the measures. In absence of that, 
there has been unpredictability, there has been fatigue, and there has been the need for businesses to try to adapt on their own. What that means then is that there are differences in interpretation as to what should be done by a business versus what shouldn't. So you'll have police walking into one restaurant with their interpretation and then another restaurant down the street with a different interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's what I want to start with because yeah. that is our theme at this point in time is bring us predictability, mm -hmm. collaborate with us, communicate with us. And so we are able to, to have our business community understand a little bit better because we're going to have these ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do at an up? What do we do at a down? I think that um, we continue to lobby and advocate for that even today, a year later. Yeah, rightly so. I, I do recall that very same conversation a year ago where, you know, the easiest example is to look at Mexico or, or Central America. They use a stoplight system. It's simple enough. You know, you go yellow, orange, green. I mean, yellow, mm -hmm. orange, red. Mm -hmm. And you know what type of uh, restrictions will be put in place in each phase rather than waiting for the latest SI to That's know right. what is going to be restricted. But before we move forward on that, I, I just want to get a reaction. The Prime Minister mentioned what is considered the uh, evil word <laughs> for the wider community in this pandemic, which is lockdown. Mm -hmm. And they're not there yet. And for a while, they've said that they would prefer to not move into a lockdown phase. But he says, if things can't get under control, this is something they will be exploring. What's your immediate reaction to that as a business community? You want to start, Kathy? Sure. Um, well, quite, quite, quite an interesting question. Um, I honestly feel that coming back to what Morris mentioned, I think it's important that collaboration and communication play a role here. And I think with more collaboration and more communication with the business committee, I think we will identify ways where the message gets across. And, this, and the message of we are all in this together, to use a phase that we have heard over and over. Um, Delta is a whole other spectrum of COVID because its ability to spread, because of its ability to spread so quickly and so easily. So I sincerely feel that the collaborative approach, the communicative approach, and the, the, the ability to be predictable will help as well in, in the circumstance, in this current situation, and in that way, possibly assist with not getting us to that point of being locked down. I think we all understand that balance between health and economics. And all of us don't want to get there. So if all of us or as many of us as possible are contributing towards this and understanding all we, what all we can do to play our part, then that will be a step in the right direction to prevent that lockdown. So it doesn't necessarily scare me and get me nervous. The point is, so what can I do to prevent that from happening as a business? That's how I see it. And then as a citizen, the same question is what I'm asking. What can I do as a citizen, having family members, having friends, having others that you are worried or concerned about because Delta is a health risk? What can we do to support and help so that does not happen? That's my initial knee-jerk reaction to that. Now, coming back to, to the part of collaboration and communication, um, what is the engagement with the chamber or the private sector with the decisions being made um, in how we manage COVID? Um, I will want uh, Catherine to also speak on this as she is the one that is our representative running our uh, medical response through the chamber. Um, the, the chamber sits, well, was invited to sit on the COVID-19 medical advisory um, team, which mm -hmm. was a government-led body. Uh, we also sat or sit on the National Coordinating Committee for the, oh, the rolling out of the COVID-19 vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so we have been contributing via those means as mm -hmm. well. How active those committees are is another question um, and that's why we still have to ask for that collaboration because we are seeing decisions being made and when we check with our representatives did this come out of one of your committee meetings you know mm -hmm. what was the discussion there what was the reasoning there have been no meetings and so has there been 
a business approach or perspective um, taken into consideration with some of the recent decisions. Mm -hmm. Our opinion is probably no, at this point in time, there is not much of a business perspective going into some of the decisions that are being made. Mm -hmm. um, and so at this point, uh, I'll also allow Cathy to, to update us a bit as to what those com the committee has been um, doing and the work that we've been doing along mm -hmm. with the Ministry of Health to some extent with the vaccination um, the vaccination pop-ups and events and so on we have been partnering yeah. with the ministry of health but in terms of the policy direction um and so on that is where i think the collaboration needs to to expand a little yeah. bit more right so to to you know as as president marissa referenced in terms of the policy side um the lobbying is all about how can we be a part of this effort to assist and that's the goal, mm -hmm. because ultimately, you know, there is, it's important for us to maintain a balance between, but also economic recovery mm -hmm. and being able to be a part of a collaborative, um, communicative group of entities working towards a common goal, I think is essential. So, you know, she did a great job in explaining that component. But in addition to that, um, to add a little bit more about the efforts that the that the chamber has been making. First and foremost, I must say from the very start, there's been a lot of information sharing, mm -hmm. um, a lot of efforts with communicating with members, but also communicating with the public in general mm -hmm. about what do you need to know, especially for the business community in, in, in the setup and the preparations of your protocol to be safe, to, be, to protect your employees, protect your business. So there's been a lot of work put into that. Um, that work continues. And yesterday, there was an informational session um, that was done via Zoom and that was hosted by the Chamber, but was in participation or in, in uh, we, all, we also had other participants as well. Um, we had PAHO and we also had the Ministry of Health and Wellness representative, Dr. Baird, to be specific. And their goal was to communicate to those persons who are questioning whether it's safe to get that vaccine and why and answer questions, ask, answer questions about persons, for instance, who are vulnerable persons, persons who might have, are pregnant, persons who may just have had a child, persons who may be breastfeeding, all of these different examples, let's just say you have some sort of chronic disorder, is, you know, is it safe for you to, to get that vaccine? Um, so some of them are health questions, but some of them are also connected with the safety of being around individuals as well. And um, though that information, informational session is not the first, um, but is one that was carried out yesterday. We also have another session coming up on Thursday, and we encourage everybody to take a look at our social media page and learn a little bit more about that session as well. Um, so this effort will continue because be making people aware, training, supporting wherever possible um, will is, is, is helpful and important um, in this effort. Outside of that, um, we also have two other initiatives that we are that we did we have communicated with the ministry of health and wellness and that happened last month and we are actively moving ahead with with activating these initiatives um the first is what we call adopt a nurse mm -hmm. and this is in col in collaboration with the rotary club of belize it was a conversation that we had Last year, President Marissa will remember she was one of the guest speakers at club and we spoke about ways of collaborating and this is, an, this is now put, putting that into effect. Um, this is something that the Rotary Club of Belize has done, but we clearly see a need to expand. So now, we're, now it's, it's, it's at the chamber's end to assist in the effort towards, the, towards helping the NHS so to say, the nursing, the nursing community, with at, with getting them, getting them support wherever we can. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that Ministry of Health and Wellness has explained to us is needed, is appreciated, and um, and and so we're we're pushing this forward as well, right? And what a DAPA nurse really means is you, as a member of the business community, you as a citizen of the country, can choose to support in the payment for these individuals. 
Um, nurses, as we know, had to put aside a lot of the efforts that they were doing, for instance, with dengue, and come into the fold to assist with COVID. Now it's been a year and a half or a year and a half plus, and the efforts need, to, these other efforts like dengue, still need to be addressed, still need to be looked at. So ultimately that means bringing more nurses into the system as quickly as possible and budgeting for that sometimes take a little bit takes a little longer so where we can provide that support we are hoping to do so as well so we encourage our members we encourage others as well um, to assist with that effort because it's needed and that means more soldiers at the front line so to say mm -hmm. if we want to call our nurses frontline soldiers yeah um, um additional we also have the business influencers, and that's in essence highlighting those businesses, both chamber members and others, who are doing the right thing, who are supporting the effort, who are working towards, for instance, of getting their persons vaccinated, having a safe work environment, communicating with their employees about how to protect themselves both in office and at home home. Um, additionally, businesses who have been providing incentives, there are a number of BCCI members that have been doing that for quite some time, offering discounts, offering various support wherever possible. We know from the science, from the statistics, that one of the protections to get us to a better place and prevent these lockdowns is to get as many persons vaccinated as possible. There is a direct co correlation in every way you look at um, so it's important for us to play our part and make yeah. uh, make the efforts wherever we can to support this as well. Yeah. Now let's let's get Jody into the conversation here. Jody, of course, uh, you are here. Two, you have two purposes for being here. One to speak on your personal business perspective, and of course, as a representative for the chamber. So let's talk about the impact that you see now, a year and a half into the pandemic. Yes. Um, like um, our president said, um, there's a lot of level of uncertainty happening. Mm -hmm. And this is not only in Belize, but globally. And we have seen a downward spiral of um, operations, everything when it concerning business. Mm -hmm. uh, revenues are down. Um, the labor, some businesses needed to scale down on labor, um, decrease on salaries. And uh, when, it's, when, the, um, when the pandemic broke out in 2020, we, we had to be prepared. And um, every week at Marie Sharps, we try to do as much training as possible. We, we provide information. Uh, we had to do a walk-in fumigation system just for protec um, protection of our employees. Mm -hmm. um, we are 100% vaccinated at Marie Sharps. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to do that because we know that it's very important. And we wanted to set the example and set the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, we are 100%. And the day after that, we, we gave all of our employees a day off just to, to, to show them that we are in this together. And uh, everyone from top management to our employees are fully vaccinated at Marie Sharp. Mm -hmm. So we try to be an example and at the same time try to edu educate everyone as much as possible. And I'm glad to be part of the executive, executive council as well because you know, uh, we learn a lot, uh, we get the experience and we also get to work on these committees because we're trying to find solutions in this um, very uncertain times. Um, we as humans are very resilient. We have, you know, we have battled through the Spanish influenza back in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. We've gone through world wars, and this is just the next hurdle. But as everyone said, uh, Marissa and Catherine, that this is a collaborative effort. Yeah. And coming together, governments, private sector, public sector, um, concerned individuals and, and companies and everyone, it's something that we must come together and work on. Yeah. Now, let's come back to, to the issue of, of predictability, because I think that that's a key point to kind of uh, move forward. Yes, we're a year and a half in, but it doesn't mean it's too late. Um, one, what, what impact would that have on a business like yours? If you have a level of predictability that you know yes. today we're in orange and we may move into phase red next week. Yes, we were actually looking, we, we were saying that we were, going, we were going to rebound, that rebounding is on the way. And this third wave definitely reset the mm -hmm. bar again. So we were actually glad that, you know, we are seeing tourists coming back to Belize. We are seeing our revenues slowly climb again, our sales. You know, we're sending our, um, our delivery guys around the country. But now, guess what? The third wave come. A deadlier form of the a variant. And mm -hmm. there was a slight reset again. And like, like Marissa said, it's a wave. It mm -hmm. goes up and it comes down. 
And sometimes we, we need predictability in order to take um, very strategic business decisions mm -hmm. that would protect not only our employees, but also to move forward. Because then if, if businesses try to be resilient, then um, the economy must go on. And that, that's very important right now. Yeah. You know, we are persons, we need jobs, we need money flowing throughout the economy. Mm -hmm. And um, to be in business right now is the best shot we have. So we, we try to push whatever um, the ag agenda such as vaccination, working together, wearing our masks, following protocols. Mm -hmm. But the unpredictability, the unpredictability is serious, but we try to be as predictable as possible, trying to use information um, that's available out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in the absence of uh, a scheme like that, that would, that would tell us, um, when we talk about predictability, if we look at the situation now and we know that we're in our third wave, we're seeing increasing cases, increasing hospitalizations, uh, can you give us a reaction uh, from the business community if, uh, not necessarily um, in, this, in terms of what would happen if there's a lockdown, but the health concerns, uh, we know that there would be an enormous strain on, on the healthcare system and it doesn't only relate to treating COVID patients, there's a ripple effect. So how, uh, does, um, how, how has the Chamber been um, dealing with that issue and, 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 and getting feedback, I suppose, from its members in relation to what concerns they have health-wise? You know, what's interesting is that if, if we look at the, the likelihood, I mean, we understand that going to work is, is a gathering of people. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. Yeah. However, going to work and working within formal workplaces that are following the protocols may actually be a safer gathering than when we end up in our restaurants and our bars and hanging out at the parks and that sort of thing. So one thing that we, we have to look at as well is what is a what is a safe gathering what is a safe way for people to be in the same space right because that's what other countries around the world have had to look at um the uh, and so you we will have to grapple with the fact that yes in any space where there are a group of people could be this studio this morning there could be transmission yeah. of some sort some way nobody knows how maybe we touch the doorknob whatever it might be <laughs> Right. Um, and so on that basis, we all have to realize that if if the spread can happen at the supermarket, at the pharmacy, at the places that will stay open as essential services, then what is what is different in terms of mandating businesses to also be at a level where all the protocols, all the preventative measures are in place. Mm -hmm. Now, what you will find is that it's at the social gatherings where people will tend to become more comfortable yeah. taking off their masks, not sanitizing, um, you know, hugging mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, and so our, our submission really is that the workplace is one of the safer places to be if things are done right and if enforcement occurs. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the issues is that a lot of what we're seeing as um, per restrictions, it's, like, it's happening because we can't enforce. It's not necessarily happening because there is a direct link to, mm -hmm. um, to, to clusters coming out and that sort of thing. I mean, we haven't really heard of clusters coming out of businesses per se. We've heard that it's at the hospital, which, which sounds obvious because of this, the nature of the job but um, factories and that sort of thing. We're not hearing about clusters coming out of those. And so that gives us the evidence. And that's why it's so important that the predictability is based on data. Mm -hmm. We've been saying this for a very long time. In our confidence building measures last year, one of our key words was surge capacity. Mm -hmm. What can the public health system manage, right? based on that surge capacity, the closer you get to your surge, to your, your maximum capacity, mm -hmm. that's when you start to close things down. So I have from last year, immigration, based on surge capacity and other key indicators within the healthcare system, closely monitor the maximum number of international travelers permitted entry. This should work in tandem with health sector capacity for mm -hmm. critical care, based on the assumption that a set proportion of international travelers are likely to be COVID positive. Yeah. So what happened, and, and we have an example as a chamber, 
we have a Made in Belize event mm -hmm. where we give our entrepreneurs, micros, a chance to, to sell their products in a public space. This event, um, and, and you know, it wasn't even being planned as an event per se, but to give them a space in a market mm -hmm. environment, marketplace environment. Now, the protocols affected us. We were basically given our cease and desist. Mm -hmm. You cannot have this. No matter what protocols you plan to put in place, it's not going to happen, yeah. right? Now, when we look at that decision, and the effect it has on local micro-business. Then we look at the decision, for example, in the recent SI that says all restaurants must be at 50% capacity outdoor dining except for the keys. It sounds as though you consider higher economic growth coming from tourism and foreign travelers than the local economy that relies on its own population as well to operate and we have a problem with that mm -hmm. because we have been saying that one of the things we have to actually look at and restrict is the entry into the country because that brings with it mm -hmm. its own issues we had also made that comment relating to the land borders as well that we have to control some of the 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 incoming um the, the incoming persons so that we're able to at least see if we can handle it. Because what has happened is that we have cruise ships with thousands of people, then we have offloading. And when we're talking about 18 ventilators, two or three being taken up by non-Belizeans or people who have just come in and been unfortunately deserted here, you know, that's a serious consideration. But what is the balance here? We know the devastation that was caused when, when we no longer saw the tourism dollar coming in. And a part of the balancing act that the government is, has to make is how do we keep the tourism dollar coming in to help to sustain the economy um, and still keep people safe? But So what I'm hearing from you uh, clearly is the concern that you're giving priority mm -hmm. to that tourism dollar at potentially the sacrifice of people, so Belizeans supporting Belizean businesses. But isn't this a part of the balancing act? Like, shouldn't we be a bit more understanding to the circumstance? Is it a balance if we begin to move past data and reasoning? Mm -hmm. That's the question. There is no, and, and we are the first to say that we need to get back to business. Mm -hmm. That's the chamber's mantra, get back to business. We're the first to say that. But we are also the ones to say, as you rightly said, is there a detriment? How do we know there is a detriment? And how do we handle the potential implications of that detriment? And I think that is where we are at this point in time, because we, it's exactly what we're saying. Because the health system is being crippled, there is an impending lockdown. Mm -hmm. Because they're saying we have to stop it. We can't take any more people in the hospital. We're in a bit of a panic. We can't allow this to continue. And so that's the thing. We understand that there needs to be a balance, but we want to know what the data is. Mm -hmm. We want to be a part of the discussion. And we actually had um, submitted to the Ministry of Health and now to the Prime Minister's office a request. And at first we were looking just at granting for events because as you know, under the current SI, it is a ministerial decision. Mm -hmm within health only. We have put a proposal forward that there is a creation of an economic revitalization committee, which is made up of representatives from the business community, the, com the commission of police, the CEO in economic development and health. Mm -hmm. So that when questions come about that has to do with the economy, at first we were saying events, but at this point we need to look bigger than just granting event permissions. Yeah. We need to have the inputs of everybody um, when we're making these very critical decisions for our economy. Um, and we need to be able to justify them and, and have that rationale as well, uh, because it can come across in some cases as discriminatory against some. It cannot come across as though you were not listened to, you were not consulted. 
And I don't think that during a time like this where people are already feeling isolated, already feeling defensive, that you want to feel that they, that they want to feel that they do not have a facilitating environment that accommodates them and works with them rather than shuts them down and prohibits them from doing business. You know, I've, I've talked with a few small businesses so far and it's amazing how uh, the third wave uh, one, they automatically have the fear of the slowdown, and then they start to see the slowdown or have restrictions, and, and it becomes concerning. What are you hearing from members? You know, uh, what is the situation? Are people starting to see a decline in business activity? Are people moving around less? How does this impact our businesses today? Kathy? Okay, just, just stepping back for just to, to compliment okay. Anada a little bit. I think that, you know, the every single industry in Belize is important. Um, but we spoke about this before. So we're talking about the same adjective, the same words. And I think the point, one of the main points is diversity. We all have a part to play. The ministry is important to the to the economy, but there are other industries, the agricultural industry, the BPO industry, which I'm a part of. And, um, and these entities play an important role in employment, in foreign exchange, in many angles. And we learned from the very start of COVID that diversity is key because each industry has its um, vulnerabilities mm -hmm. due to COVID, right? And the more diverse we are, the more we are less dependent or one or on one or the next. Um, coming back real quick to Gavin's question as well. Gavin, you, you mentioned the health, um, the health sector's limitations. That's where private sector comes into play. That was one of the points that was listed on the confidence building measure, measures, and it continues to be one of the points to reference as well. Right. When, when there's limitations in terms of the testing component, for instance, within the public sector, that's where private sector is. That's where businesses say, guess what? We recognize that the numbers of persons going into public sector to get tested is too much. The time is challenging. The risk is higher. Let's try to find a way to get private sector to be a part of that. And I think the BPO industry is a great example of that. One of the things that we started um, beginning of last week, actually it wasn't the beginning of last week, it was week prior to that. Before we did have um, discussions a few days into the changes with the SI was to identify, guess what? We need to support this testing support and we need to be able to collaborate with private sector entities to get our persons tested and also to set up protocols to protect our in-office agents. Now, I think it's also important to co talk about collaboration. And um, you, you gave, I loved your question, Marlene, that spoke to predictability. Wow, that question of being able to, to have predictability means more employment and more, more investment. That ultimately means that to me. And those are power, two powerful words that we always have to keep in mind. And I believe that's applicable to almost all industry and more business and more businesses as well. So I think that's very, very cross to think about. If we can collaborate, if we understand, um, if we're able to understand better the two sides of the coin, then we can make a predictive and a statistical base or data based and also a more balanced decision as well. So I really think that collaboration is essential, especially at this stage. And we all need the help. We know the help, you know, health, health and the Ministry of Health and Wellness needs the support of of all of the rest of the, the, the government, so to say, and also needs the support from private sector as well. So how can we support? Let's find ways to do this because it's essential for all of us to avoid the situation of lockdown as you brought up before. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in, in a similar vein, um, and we, we've spoken a lot about the importance of, of data, is the chamber also monitoring uh, among its membership uh, the impacts of the pandemic, uh, especially as it stands today, in terms of um, how businesses are surviving, um, how many people are letting go staff or reducing salaries or mm -hmm. shutting down, as you say? Um, how, uh, how has the chamber been monitoring itself when, and, and so that when it um, does collaborate with the other industries, it's coming from a very informed uh, perspective? 
Um, I'll start, start sure. out here. Um, the, the, as it relates to the effect, the impact on businesses, a lot of the data we have is anecdotal because mm -hmm. we, you know, members are, and I think this is just in general, businesses don't want to share some mm -hmm. of this information, even though it's being used for good. Um, I think, you know, that a lot of the times in a small con smaller country like Belize, um, the, you know, people worry about their data getting out and it reflecting on their business and that sort of thing. Um, however, what we do have at this point in time is a poll that we're, that's active. And that poll has to do with vaccination. Like, what have you offered to your staff to encourage and incentivize vaccination? How, how much of your staff is vaccinated at this point in time? What size is your operation? So we're collecting that data uh, actively right now to inform us in terms of where are we seeing, what districts are we seeing, what industries are we seeing that have more vaccination, less vaccination, and where do the, um, the efforts need to be targeted at this point in time yeah. well there was the statistical institute's survey last year looking at the impact of mm -hmm. covid business uh, of covid on businesses mm -hmm. and it did account for and i know that there was uh, quite a bit of criticism hurled on the private sector on businesses because they feel that once the economic impact hit they passed it on to their staff directly mm -hmm. Some have been making recovery along the way, but what does this third wave mean from your personal experience with members? Um, does it now add that layer of uncertainty as to how to move forward? Because I think, Jody, you talked about mm -hmm. investment and making business decisions or strategic decisions. Let's, let's tie those two together. Mm. Definitely. Um, the, 2020, the 2020 versus 2021 pandemic is is quite different because um, we had to embrace technology in order to move forward. Mm. We had to go out and make, like many companies have to do deliveries. They no mm. longer mm. have to uh, wait in their store. They actually do a delivery service. You know, you pay a dollar, you, you could go deliver to your door. Um, you know, we try to embrace the technology as much as possible, selling online. And um, we have seen now that direct impacts on business, especially like us, we're, we're in the food industry, and we know that in this, um, in this pandemic, persons must eat. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, we met with our farmers. Uh, we said, guess what? Don't, don't slow down production of peppers. We want more peppers. Mm -hmm. But then I tell, well, it's a shutdown, and when they see us on the farm, the police will come and shut us down. So um, in 2020, we try to collect as much materials as possible. We try to buy as much um, packaging materials as possible, because then um, just last week, we, we called our Mexican supplier bottles and they said, guess what, Jody, we are be, we'll be closed for a month because we have um, 10 cases in the plant. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, well, we'll try to bring from China, but the shipping prices mm -hmm. from China to Belize has tripled, mm -hmm. doubled and tripled. So um, direct impacts, it, it's there. And then um, sometimes it's very hard not to pass certain, um, these, these kind of um, impacts on our employees. Mm -hmm. But sometimes just to stay afloat, we need to, find, um, we need to find parts in the balance sheet that we need to cut down, mm -hmm. whether it be rent, whether it be salaries, uh, whether it be trying to find a bottle that's cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to curtail everything. <laughs> and at the same time, we have, to, we have to be there for employees because this is a very dramatic time as well for them. It's yeah. very, um, they're very taxing. Yes, yeah. mentally taxing. So um, we try to motivate them because we need productivity. 100% now, especially at the time of hours are limited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were going to say, Kathy? Just, yes, just to add to, to Jody, one of the things that um, I let our secretariat team work extremely hard in terms of you know, going through the process, because with, with Made in Belize, of trying to establish protocols, collaborating with public sector, with the police, with the Ministry of Health, it didn't work out because of the way we understand that. But in this process, we were able to speak to a lot of young entrepreneurs, a lot of SMEs. And, you know, I'm in awe of them in hearing the, the conversations coming from the Secretariat members that were on the phone speaking to these entrepreneurs. And you see a lot of resilience. You see a lot of willingness to adopt. You use a powerful word before, Marlene. 
um, that word of adopting, of changing. And Jody gave the perfect example of using technology where possible. Zoom was not an option, for instance. Um, I could, I would have not been able to be there today yeah. if not for Zoom. So we see these changes coming down. And um, and coming back to the SMEs, you know, you you hear them changing their product line, speaking more about health as an example, right? Offering components to just protect your immune system or build your immune system. We also heard quite a bit that they want the opportunities to be able to promote their product and they're trying to find ingenious, safe ways to distribute their product, as Jody, as Jody said as well. So there are some positives in that have come out of this delivery services and the changes that happen, I'm sure we may remember, and applications about getting food delivered came out of this as well. So we see those things happening, and um, we have to try to encourage those things more and try to ha try to also um, communicate and, and offer some level of transparency and predictability for these businesses that are finding ways to battle through. They may have had to make changes in terms of how they run their model, um, what phases of the business has developed thus far, but you, you, the goal is, is not to fail. So ultimately you are pushing forward and I must say we saw a lot of that in those conversations coming through from the maiden yeah. ladies, um, the discussions that we had. It has been amazing to see the innovation oh, that some amazing. people have employed and, and um, I think it is something that we can tap into as we move forward. But, but let, me, let me just ask one final question in, in looking at uh, what I hear from you. What I hear from you very clearly is, even if it's a year and a half in, let's sit and put some predictability in place, some markers for businesses to know. My question to you is, is it unreasonable to ask for predictability in a time where every country and every leader across the world is figuring it out as we move along? Delta wasn't supposed to be here, and the vaccination was supposed to get us back on the path to what was normal. Um, so that's my question to you today. Absolutely, I think that there can be predictability to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, in any situation, there is some predictability, um, and, and you must grab that predictability and work with it as much as possible. When we get into our cars every day, we, we are predicting that we're heading to this location, but something might be an obstacle in the way today yeah. that, that prevents us from getting there. But we have the predictability that there's gas in the tank, that we've serviced the vehicle. It should get us there mm -hmm. if something doesn't get in the way. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of approach that we are looking for as well, to say with certain measures in place, we should get past the next two weeks or we should get past the next three weeks but of course predictability does not mean lack of flexibility mm. because even in predictability you have to be flexible you have to be able to quickly adapt but that's why what we are looking at is not a, a an approach that says, okay, for the next two weeks, what are we going to do? We're looking at, a, at, a, at an approach that says these are protocols and systems in place that we can adapt to as situations change. So even in our confidence building measures from last year, we had a phased approach to lockdown. Mm -hmm. And that is based on things that will not change really on a daily basis. For example, we say that if you are in the green zone from the health triggers less than five percent of tests for the last 14 days have been positive so that gives you some predictability because mm -hmm. if you're looking at the positivity numbers and it's over five percent you know we're heading into another zone another mm -hmm. phase that needs another approach mm -hmm. that is some amount of predictability now if it is that we are in the green phase and we have a spike that skips orange to red that is where you will say boy, things looking bad, how, do we be, how are we going to be flexible mm -hmm. in this situation despite having our structures for predictability? So that's really what has to happen. And many countries around the world also have their structures and protocols. 
um, but then they do have to react as well. And that's what we're talking about. How do we react and why do we react in the way that we react? What is the basis for that? What are the triggers? What are the triggers? Yeah. What are, what's the advice that you're getting? What perspectives were taken into consideration when this decision was being made? And we think that if that is clear, and if that is clearly communicated to the public at large, then you will have better reaction. Then you will have better um, compliance. Mm -hmm. Because overall, we can see that the mask up um, campaigns and so on have actually worked. Belizeans are fairly compliant once they understand what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. The question is, do we understand what needs to be done as it relates to what we're talking to today? And from the discussions in our secretariat and, and all of us are business people operating in businesses every day, the, the response that we're getting within that um, microcosm of the business community and the larger business community is that no, we don't have that predictability and that is a part of what is um, preventing the country from keeping its productivity going at a steady pace despite whatever happens yeah. at any point in time. All right. And uh, quickly before we close, uh, let's just remind some of our viewers of uh, the chamber, some of the chamber's initiatives and uh, things that they should be aware of. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, well, the chamber is remaining very active. We encourage people to be members of the chamber because then you're on our mailing list, then you're uh, invited to our mixers. Uh, you're, in, you're able to get special access into some of the, um, the events that we've been having as well. You're able to access even the secretariat. If you want to lobby something in your industry, you're able to say to the secretariat, I'm having a problem. Can the executive look at this problem? Take it to the committees that we sit on. That's, the, that's really the chamber has that influence and that position where we sit in some of the rooms and at the tables where a lot of decisions are being made. And that's important. Um, this week, we have an event coming up on Thursday at 5.30. It's for members only. Uh, and it is in partnership with the UA Open Campus. Mm -hmm. It's called an academic approach to the COVID regulations. And this has Mr. Danny Roberts, who is a labor educator and lead partner at IR Plus Consultants and former head of the Hugh Shera Labor Studies Institute. And um, Mr. Roberts is well known regionally as a labor expert. And of course, he has a lot of um, experience since the pandemic as it relates to dealing with different countries, different workplaces, and how they have had to adapt to whatever is happening there. Mm -hmm. So we think that he can give a very good contextual approach from mm -hmm. the region in terms of what he has seen in other countries, what he interprets um, from his own knowledge of what Belize is going through. And so we encourage our members to, to register. They can WhatsApp us at 614-3138 or call us at 223-5330. Um, to, to get registered or just check their email. Um, the chamber would have sent a registration link by email to all members. So we invite everyone to, to come out, well, all our members to come out to that event and to ask whatever questions they might have. And you do have your poll ongoing on your Facebook page that people can participate in Correct. and uh, help to provide some context as to how people are doing at this time. Absolutely. All right. Well, we appreciate you weighing in. We know that while we talk very often about COVID and health and, and school, uh, definitely <laughs> uh, looking at the private sector's perspective is, is equally important. So thank you for coming in. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. And with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be getting the latest update on how our public transportation system is changing to be inclusive of persons with disabilities. Please, thank you. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.